Hey, hey everybody, hope you're doing well today. In this video, we are gonna look at five study tips to help you get prepared in your studies of demand, supply, and market equilibrium. If you're new to this channel, my name is Brad Cartwright. I teach IB economics here in Santiago, Chile. And on this channel, you will find over 300 videos that cover the entirety of your course of studies in microeconomics, macroeconomics, international economics, and development economics. If you are an IB student, this channel was made for you. If you are in the A-level program or in the AP program, you will find all of the essential information that you need for your studies of micro and macroeconomics. And if you are a university student, no matter what university you're studying in in the world, this channel has all of the information you will know for any, any introductory course in economics. I see this as a collaborative effort between me and you. So please subscribe to this channel, turn on the notifications so that you can stay in contact with me. I realize that not every video that I post will be something that's relevant to your studies right then. I know this is not dude perfect. I don't expect you to watch it right away, but it's very helpful that you know when I post a video so that you know if it's something maybe coming up in your studies or maybe something that you might need for review and just so you can stay informed. All right, cool. Let's take a look at the five tips I have for you in studying for demand, supply, and market equilibrium. Okay, number one, you gotta know the vocabulary and real life examples cold every single time. Law of demand, quantity demanded, law of supply, quantity supplied, market equilibrium, consumer surplus, producer surplus, all of the non-price determinants of demand and supply. When I mean you have to know that vocabulary, what I'm saying to you is you gotta be able to use it with precision. This is not like sophisticated cognitive activity here. No, it is learning a new language. And as you begin your studies of economics, what you'll realize is if you can't talk the talk, if you can't use the words in their proper context with precise definitions, you're not gonna do well, okay? So grab you know, your notebook, grab your textbook, go Quizlet crazy and make sure that you know precise definitions for everything in economics, not just in this chapter, but in all of your studies of economics. Think of yourself as learning a second, third, fourth language, and this one's called economics. Okay, my friends, know the vocabulary or you're lost. Cool. Also, real life examples. Make sure you have examples of any scenario you can think of. I'm going to give you some and don't get creative. This is not a creative endeavor. Don't try to impress the examiner with some creative idea. No, go with the tried and true. Go with something that you know is dead on and is not gonna, gonna cost you unexpected um, marks on any sort of assessment you might get, okay? If you are curious about what those terms are, look down in the description box, there's a link to them. And they're also listed at the bottom of the description box. I have an entirety of information in that description box that's gonna help you review for whatever assessment you might be taking. Okay, so that was number one, cool. Number two, you gotta know the base demand and supply diagram. This diagram is the world famous <laughs> economics diagram that is at the basis of all economic study. When you get to macroeconomics, when you get to international economics and in development economics, all of the relationships between supply and demand and supply and demand is really just like kind of like what I want if I'm a, a consumer and if you are the supplier, what are your best interests, right? And where we come together, that's the equilibrium, right? That's the handshake that we talk about in this, in this unit. So, so it's critical that you know that diagram cold, okay? In the description box below, I have a how to, in the how to draw series, there's how to draw the basic supply and demand diagram. Go down in there, in there I give you a little simple device to try to remember it. If you don't know that diagram, you've got to know it cold because it is the beginning of every economic story, whether it be in government intervention, market failure, or on down the line in your studies, you've got to know the basic supply and demand diagram, how to label it, perfected perfectly every single time. I can't reiterate it enough. You gotta know that diagram. Okay, if you do, excellent. Now you move on to number three, study tip number three, which is there is always going to be an event that happens. 
and I want you to remember this in all of your studies of economics, you're going to get a, a situation that has a status quo and then there's going to be an event and just one, only one. So the status quo is going to be, guess what, that base diagram. See how important it is? And then something's going to happen. Either the price is going to change or there's going to be a change in the non-price determinants of demand or the non-price determinants of supply. That's it. Okay? That event will move either the demand curve or the supply curve and that's it. And I tell my students here like when you draw that base diagram, which is why you got to know it so well, and then you look at the rest of the question and one of those lines shifts, put your pencil down. You're done. You got it because there will never be a follow-up event that you will have to analyze, okay? So there's gonna be one shift based on one event, okay? Now, what might that event be? Well, that event might be just a change in price, in which case you're gonna either move up and down the demand curve or up and down the supply curve. That's easy, okay? But then there are three non-price determinants of demand, and that means that the, line, the, the, the demand curve is gonna shift, okay? What are those things? Well, one of them is income, right? And if your income shifts or income in society, like in a whole uh, nation shifts, then and it goes outward, then demand is going to go outward, right? If after a war or some catastrophe incomes go down, then demand is going to shift inward. Pretty straightforward, right? But by looking at the kinds of goods that you would demand, you can find out if it's a normal good or if it's an inferior good. Cool. If you're confused, again, check the description box below. I go into all of these in more detail in other videos, right? So the second non-price determinant of demand is the price of other products, right? And so that means, and you're gonna be able to understand the nature of a good based on substitutes or complements. You know, substitutes are things that are bought instead of one another. If there's a change in price of Coca-Cola, what's gonna to happen to the, to the demand, the quantity demanded for Pepsi? Those are substitutes. What about complements? Complements, the best example are Kindles and eBooks. If Kindles are really cheap, more people are going to buy them and therefore more people are going to consume or demand Kindles. Know those examples. If you don't, check the description box below. Make sure you're well-versed in what happens for those non-price determinants of demand. The last non-price determinant of demand is, of course, tastes and preferences, which is the whole thing about whether it's cool or not, right? Like, you might not like yellow shirts. It doesn't matter <laughs> if you, if you, you know, what the price is of this. If you just don't like it, it doesn't matter. But if yellow shirts all of a sudden become really cool, then guess what's going to happen to the demand of them? They're going to go up. Okay, cool. So those are the non-price determinants of demand. Now, an event might happen on the supply side. That event might be a change in price or that event might be a non-price determinant of supply, in which case the supply curve would actually shift. Those things would be like the cost of the factors of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Those things might be the price of other products that could be produced other than the one you're producing. Yeah, they could be the state of technology. It might have to do with some sort of future expectations. It might have to do with government intervention. If you need more information on that, check the link below. I go into that in very big detail in other videos in this series. And, but it's critical that you know those things. What is the event? And then that leads to number four. And number four is you gotta be able to understand and analyze the impact of that event analysis, analysis, analysis. If one of those lines shifts because of a change in a non-price determinant of demand or supply, what does it mean? What does it mean for producers? What does it mean for um, consumers? What might it mean for the government? What might it mean for the society as a whole? Okay. What about market efficiency? What about allocative, uh, the, a proper allocation of resources? Are those things affected? And you, an analysis means that you're going to be able to talk about it on the diagram, right? In other words, like, you know, P1Q1 changed to P2Q2, and this is what happened. And here's the consumer surplus. Here's the producer surplus. Here's the new price level. Here's the new quantity supplied or exchange in the marketplace. You got to know all that stuff, okay? So you have to know how to analyze the impact of the event. That is tip number four, okay? Tip number five, you got to make a judgment. You are the economist. You are going to make a judgment on the impact of that event, okay? You are going to evaluate the impact of that event on, in the beginning, make it simple. Consumers, producers, the government, and society as a whole. Those four, consumers, producers, government, and society as a whole. 
Remember that. You can look at them multifaceted later on, like in the long run, in the short run, the advantages, the disadvantages. But anytime something happens on a graph, you need to be able to explain and evaluate and then make a judgment. And by make a judgment, what I mean is you are the economist. Have confidence. You have studied. You have know the vocabulary. You know how to draw the diagrams. It's properly labeled. You've shifted the right curve. And now you come in as the economist to say, hey, this is what they could do. Look, that's one hand. This is another thing they could do. Look, that's another hand. And then you're going to make a declarative statement at the bottom. Whoa, check that. Yeah, you know what? Evaluations round like this. It has multifaceted. It is, it is both good and bad. It's, it's, it's perfect and flawed all at the same time. It can't be perfect and flawed. It, there's always another view on it, okay? So evaluations are round, right? And you make a round ball like this, and this is how you can remember it on the, on the assessment. It's like, okay, look, on one hand, the government could do this and make this the one you're not gonna choose, okay? On the other hand, they could do this, right? And go a little bit more in detail into the other hand and then make a judgment, and you're always gonna make the judgment based on the last thing that you wrote, because that's the most effective thing to do in an evaluation or in a paragraph or in an essay. The last one, boom, evaluate it and make a declarative statement. You know, given all the information that we have, it, the government's best decision would be boom, and go with it, or boom, whatever it might be, whatever the question asks you to do, okay? So those are the five tips that I can give you to help you be ready for an assessment on demand, supply, and market equilibrium. Yes, and my friends, if you are at this point, you are done with the basic understanding of economics. From here, the stories just get huge. And I'm telling you, this is what you got to remember in your studies of economics. This is human behavior. It's me. It's you. It's, it's what the governments do. It's life. It's what's going on in the streets. It's what's going on in your house. It's what's going on in the entire world around us internationally. Economics is the foundational understanding of political thought. Did you hear that? Your studies of economics are providing you with a foundation of understanding political thought the world over. It doesn't matter where you live. That's how exciting economics is. All right, my friends, if you have any comments, please put them in the comment box below. If you have suggestions for other students, my goodness, let's make this a collaborative effort via the, the, the comment boxes below. There are thousands of students watching these videos every single day. And just imagine the list of helpful information we could share on this channel by going back and forth and sharing examples of non-price determinants of supply, of demand, maybe cool little things that happen in your country, whatever they are, share them below. All right, my friends. Excellent. Congratulations. Feel really good. Make sure you can do all of these things. And if you can, go to bed, get a good night's sleep, and be ready for the assessment tomorrow. All right, my friends, take care of yourselves. Be good to yourselves as well. And we'll talk to you in a bit.